Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. Hello, hello, hello. This is Bible study for the third Sunday of Easter, Sunday, May 1st. Uh, it's going to be a great week. We are excited to be welcoming Bishop Patricia Lowe of the St. Paul Area Synod. She's going to be preaching with us this week. Uh, and so we have absolutely no idea what she's preaching on. So we're just going to make up this Bible study as we go and hope that it resonates with whatever it is that she decides to say on Sunday. And uh, we don't become heretics in the process because I think that she can do that. Right. She gets to, she's got like a stamp Ooh, for heretics or something. I think that's part of the office. I'm not sure how it works. Um, anyway, our introduction for today reads, the disciples make a big splash and eat breakfast with the risen Jesus, wading in the water, remembering baptism and eating with Jesus, celebrating Holy Communion is our weekly encounter with the risen Christ. Jesus asks us again and again, do you love me? And Jesus invites us again and again to follow him, bringing the Easter life to others. So that is our intro. We are going to dig into these texts for the day, and we're actually going to start with Acts as we move through um, this lengthy uh, season of Easter tide, 50 days, uh, all of these uh, week of weeks of Sundays here. Uh, we're walking through the book of Acts. And so uh, today we're going to begin with Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Uh, and it's a familiar story about Mr. Saul. And so I'm just going to start reading it. Acts reads, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul asked, who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying and he has seen a vision um, that a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And for several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. So this story from Acts chapter 9, I'm sure is one that's fairly familiar. It comes up just about every year as we're walking through this Easter season. Um, but there are, let's see here, one, two, three things. Three things that I want to kind of pop, pull out of it for our study today. Um, the first is this idea of conversion versus calling. Um, and we often talk about this text as being a, the story of the conversion of Saul, um, that he moves from basically Judaism and converts to Christianity, right? That, that's the idea here. Um, but I want to I wanna argue with us uh, this morning that this is... Uh, while, while we can talk about it as conversion all you might want, might well want, uh, I'd like to talk about it as a call um, because there are uh, 
there are so many random bits and pieces of this and in the rest of Saul's ministry, Saul who becomes Paul's ministry, um, it really kind of look at it as a as more of a calling as opposed to a conversion. And so um, first of all, I think that it's useful to remember that Paul goes on to um, reinterpret the law um, as an expansion of God's love, right? And so he never, he never like dismisses the law, the, the words of the Hebrew scriptures, right? He never gets rid of that in his work and in his life. He just reinterprets his understanding of it as an expansion of who God is. And I think that that's really cool. Um, we also have in the story Ananias, right? Who is Jewish, um, who comes to him and speaks with him. And then later on um, in Acts chapter 22, Ananias will tell Paul um, that the God of our fathers appointed you, right? And so Ananias and Paul, Ananias and Saul have this conversation together and this commonality together uh, in the basis of their Jewishness, right? And so it, it, it really, that remains the firm foundation um, of who Saul is. Um, he also, as we read, goes on and preaches in synagogues, right? Because he's a well-respected and upright member of the Jewish community. So he continues that work um, amongst uh his his fellow Jewish folks just with an eye toward expanding the law of God and the love of God to include more people, right? To bring the Gentiles into this community as opposed to le less closing off and separating these two communities and more saying, hey, this is this Jesus is for all of us. Um, and what does that look like? And what does that mean? And that becomes the conversation. And I think that that's important because so much of Paul's writings later on become the basis for supersessionism and the anti-Semitism that we talked about over the past, well, we always are talking about, um, that comes out of the scriptures. But if you look at some of Paul's writings and you think to yourself, he's writing this as a Jewish man, all of a sudden, these writings become significantly less anti-Semitic and significantly more, hey, fellow Jewish people who I am also a part of, let's, what does it mean for us to expand the law and the love of God to other people? Right. And, and the anti-Semitism is not something that he wrote, but something that we have interpreted into it as Christians later on. Um, and so I, I like that idea of this being a calling as opposed to a conversion. That's one. Two, the laying on of hands that happens in this text is beautiful and wonderful. And it's just totally at the forefront of my mind, especially after Vicar John, now Pastor John's ordination this past weekend. Um, where all of those, uh, all of the pastors and deacons and folks uh, who are representatives of congregations get to come forward and lay on hands as part of the ordination, right? Uh, we do this for baptism, right? We always we lay on hands when we baptize a child. We do this for confirmation. We'll do this in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll invite the confirmands to come forward who are affirming their baptism. And we'll lay hands on them and we'll say, stir up in so-and-so your Holy Spirit, oh Lord, right? Um, this this process of laying on hands, uh, this this physical, this physicality of touch, this tangibleness that is uh, the connection of the community um, is so very powerful in this text. And it comes up again and again and again, and it gets pulled into our rights again and again and again. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Uh, and then three, the whole concept of the this, this guy Ananias in this text, who I have totally skipped over in my life up to this point, but I was just struck by it as I was reading this text again today. Um, Ananias is just like this perfect uh, example of the church, right? Because Ananias uh, is called by God, right? A faithful person called by God to go into the world and do things, right? Um, and encounter somebody who has experienced the divine and then comes alongside them and helps them helps them interpret that experience. And isn't that what our call is as a people of God, right? That whoever it is that has encountered God in any way, shape, or form in the world, mm -hmm. and then comes to us for some sort of interpretation, we're here called to just be like, come on, let's let's talk about this together. Let's explore this together. Let's see what's going on together. And I think that that's beautiful. And, and Ananias will come up again and again throughout the book of Acts uh, to come alongside Saul and others who are new to this way, right? This new Jesus movement, and he'll he'll work with them, and he'll say, you know what, that is a cool experience. Let's talk about that again and again and again, and let's interpret that in terms of what we know and what we might learn. And I think that's cool. So there's a lot in this text, but those three things I think are the coolest. And I think they're fun. 
All right. I have a comment. Um, and can you give me share screen? Let me share my screen. Um, and I think uh, when we wrap people up in prayer shawls, we lay hands on them to let them know that they're not alone and kind of infuse the prayer shawl with our prayers as they navigate whatever's going on in their lives. Jules, it's not letting me do it today. Weird. I don't know what's going on there. It must be something funky in my settings. If you've got something to share, though, we can throw it in the comment section of the videos. Yeah, the, it's a really cool picture. It's the conversion of Paul the Apostle by Caravaggio. I don't know if any of you have remembered that, that painting. Um, Caravaggio is my favorite artist um, as far as like overall artists. I think he does the most incredible stuff with like chiaroscuro, um, his, this play with light and dark and how he depicts the biblical characters in, in many of um, his, his paintings is really astonishing. And, and if you look that up, uh, the conversion of Paul, Caravaggio, what you'll notice is um, there's, a, there's a big horse and he's laying on his back, sort of alarm like this. And, and they painted that within a different time scape to show uh, sort of like he, he was not, that's why they say when you're knocked off your horse, it's like a matter of pride. Um, but it's just this beautiful, um, I don't know, a lot of times I think when we add images to certain texts, it can make us think about them a little bit differently. So look it up, Caravaggio, conversion of St. Paul. It's very, it's a beautiful painting. There's a lot more about that, that painting, but um, yeah. That's all I'll say about that. What, what, what's up next? Vicar Michael is going to lead us in the psalm. All right. Oh, well, hello, everyone. We have Psalm 30, and I will just jump right into reading it for you. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O oh Lord. I pleaded, my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O oh Lord, and have mercy upon me. O oh Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O oh Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. This psalm, when I read it the first time, I'm like, I need to read that again. And when I did that, I saw a lot of uh, things that uh, really brought some pieces to my heart, and especially that sense of joy, that love that we have. I also consulted, uh, unfortunately, a professor I was never never able to have. It is Invitations to the Psalms by Rolf and his brother Carl Jacobson, who uh, do great work on the Psalms. And I just wanted to pull out a couple pieces there. And one of the pieces I didn't read was oftentimes what sort of causes me maybe to stumble a little bit or question and wonder is the uh, superscription to the palm. And basically, I didn't include that. And this one reads a psalm, a song of dedication of the temple of David. And I'm like, what is that all about? What does that mean? I know that this is a song of thanksgiving, but the superscription I'm told in here is a psalm. And the Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah. And that should sound familiar. Although the psalm probably was not originally written, or originally written for the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah, 
which commemorates the rededication of the temple in 164 BCE during the Maccabean period, but it came to be read at the festival. So read in that context, the person of I or the Psalm, I will extol you, for you have drawn me out, stands for any worshiper at Hanukkah. And I think that is that flavor of this, this idea that we will see kind of in the fourth verse of how this appeals to everyone, myself included. And that's that joy. Uh, jumping back into some of the mechanics of this, another piece I discovered was a lot of these Psalms of Thanksgiving kind of read as a, a chapter. So we have a first chapter where we would have a crisis, requesting help, receiving or promising praise. And then in the second chapter, which is what this is a version of, we have the recollection of the crisis, which we have right off the bat, uh, describing whatever help was received and delivering the praise. What is concrete here is the relationship with God and how that is uh, can be very dynamic. Because when you look it up, it is lifted up and my enemies have not triumphed. And it is obvious to me that I encounter many things in life and of those, it's when I look at the joy that I get from those that is so much more encouraging rather than saying, oh, no, it happened again or not again or why me? But it's that idea of, yeah, we all go through those in our life. But when we have these songs of praise and what they mean helps us to know that God is always there. So when we look at verse five, God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. And it's that idea, again, recognizing for me that God is the one that is in charge. God does not work on my time frame as much as I might hope and pray for that. It's being patient and really being in this love that is for all time. And then the psalmist uh, also talks about, and to me, it almost starts to sound as if there's this, oh, I've got everything made in verse seven, you, O Lord. With your favor made me as strong as the mountains. Kind of when we, when I think of the times I maybe get full of myself, just when I think I've got, you know, the old everything figured out, you know, I've, and then suddenly there's a new question and I might not know the answer. And that's just fine when I know that I can pray on it, I can wait on it, but I'm not alone. And that's why this invitation, the song of Thanksgiving, is for all of us to sing. And the fact that this period of, I will use the term suffering, but this idea of being pulled down into the pit, you know, what we oftentimes consider to be, uh, you know, hell or purgatory or all these places where we're not really sure, but even in those places, God exists. God is there to pull us from that pit like this writer was. And then in the end, when, when Pastor Jules mentioned the prayer shawl and all that, I think of verse uh, 11, you have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth, the clothes of mourning, and then clothed me with joy. And in that joy, I think of swaddling baby. I think of a prayer shawl. I think of, you know, even the stole that I so look forward to that, you know, Pastor John got and Pastor Madeline. And it's that matter of the joy. And it's not a it, selfishly, perhaps a personal joy, but it's a joy that's shared. And it's that, Tanner said, the laying on of hands, the sharing of that thanksgiving for the joy that God gives to us, but gives to us not to hide away and put in the silo, but to share with everyone, to put forth for everyone. And that's where this ends up with this glorious, therefore my heart sings to you without ceasing. It's this unending joy, much like the unending has said the steadfast love that we have, and I will give you thanks forever, which sounds so beautiful and wonderful, and it is. It's remembering those moments when things aren't going so well that we have to think of that thanksgiving that God is working through those, and, uh, and sometimes it's very difficult, but it's understanding that it is God looking out for us and God's going to be there. So that's where Psalm 30 takes me. Hopefully, as you look at that and read that, you'll get some of that because it really gets to the fact of it tells us who God is kind of by what God has done. 
And God is there to pull me up out of those times of despair and realize that there is joy. My little sign back here, my laughter, and bring that. And not only that I get that, but I get that from other people. So I encourage you to look for that joy, clothe yourself in joy. Hopefully as we pull off these heavy duty parkas and hats and mittens, that we uh, have the joy of the change of the seasons. One of my most joyful things as much as uh, we move on to the next one. So, And in moving on, I will be moving on to, I think we're at uh, some revelation. Right Unless on. I really love the line, um, Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's one of my favorite lines in there. All right, so Revelation, singular, not S, Revelation 5, 11 through 14. It's way at the last book in the Bible. And this is a, a Revelation, a, a apocryphal sort of piece here. And it's John that we think is writing this. And he says, starting at verse 11, that I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads, thousands and thousands, singing with a full voice. Worthy is a lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessed and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Man, love it. Um, I read a little bit about... Uh, Wes Howard Brooks' book, Come Out My People, God's Call Out of the Empire in the Bible and Beyond. And this was through the lens of C. West Daniels, um, Unworking Preacher. And I'd like to highlight just a couple of things. Uh, we note the scroll. I always correlate the scroll with uh, the basically the mission statement of Jesus that he read from Isaiah. Um, we talked about that a few weeks ago in worship, and uh, yeah, it's just it's great. Talks a little bit about the great promise of the kingdom and religio. Um, religio is is a very cool word. Um, if you break it down, it it actually is word the word part of uh, ligaments, um, those things that sort of tie us together or bind us together. And I like to think of religion as, as a real communal way of understanding our faith tradition. It's about community. Whereas um, I think a lot of people say, yeah, I'm a real spiritual person, but I'm not religious. And I think, yes, but um, spirituality is a little bit more an individual way of understanding your faith perhaps, but both create a great connection with God. And religion is about, relationship with God and relationship with neighbor. Um, in that book by Come Out My People, God's Calling of Empire in the Bible and Beyond, talks about God's home as a place of sacred encounter, um, where social and economic tribes, as in Judah and Israel, come together and care for others, um, particularly the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, and the alien. And I just bought a new book. It's called Families of the Bible. A New Perspective, and it's by Kamala Blessing. It was written about, uh, I think, 10, 12 years ago. But one of the things that I found really interesting is something that's called um, Real Widows. And I want to just mention this because I hadn't heard this before. It talks about how families are put together, the roles of family members, um, what each of the roles of the family are servants, overseers, elders, men, women, and something strange called real widows as opposed to all widows. Of course, not every household was big enough to have every such role filled. These were common household roles involving, in, involving traditional duties such as elder women caring for children and other elder women. Here's the thing that I thought was super interesting. Real widows, meaning those who couldn't have children after a certain age, mm. 
widows had a church role. In fact, the text points strongly to a paid position in the churches held by the older widows whose role was an extension of their household role. They visited the sick, prayed for people, provided pastoral care. Those are so-called real widows as opposed to the one, young ones who could remarry and have children. And I just thought that was so interesting because the role of the widows, I think at All Saints Lutheran Church is huge too, you know? They care for each other, they check in on each other. Uh, widowers do the same, but that's a, just a kind of a special piece of it. He goes on to talk about the religion of empire, um, which is protecting power, monopolizing violence, casting suspicion on others, focus on destroying enemies, stockpiling resources. And yet in this text and beyond, we are called out as an assembly or a congregation, um, ecclesia, right? That idea of being a part of, of a much bigger community. All of us have a place in it. What does it mean to be bound together by religio, the reattaching of ligaments? Um, and then the other interesting things about the book of Revelation, just to toss out there, is this idea of the lamb, the word lamb shows up over, um, shows up 30 times. And non, it's a, this idea of nonviolent, and it's one that hears and sees. And empires, on the other hand, need scapegoats. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, and maybe Pastor Rebecca can expand on this a little bit more, but there, there was a, a tradition of scapegoating where people would attach the sins and to a goat and then send it away. And that was the way that they did sin removal. And now we have this lamb that's come who is being worshiped, who's... Uh, who worthy is a lamb who is slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and blessing and glory. This idea of the empire has shifted. It's no longer about um, what I can get, casting suspicion, getting more power, monopolizing, but rather it's about community and how do you uplift and how do you care for and how do you nurture and what does family really look like within uh, the context that we're we're peering at when we look at these illuminated texts that stand up and sort of shimmer before us. And I, I just really love that repetitive chorus of blessing and honor and glory and might, you know, that that's uh, anytime you get that repetitive sort of thing, you sort of sit up and go, um, okay, what's going on in this text? And why is this repeated over and over again? Because this is God's power and glory and honor and wisdom and might. It's not ours. It's not us to Lord over, but rather to, bend our knee and recognize that that God is the one to whom be glory and honor and blessing. And that's where I'll leave it today. I know that was kind of a lot. It might have spiraled a little bit, but I just thought it was so interesting, that piece about widows I'd never read before. And I um, just the definition between real widows and those that are younger and could remarry. And that the function is really important for the church. Oh, always has been. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jules. Yep. Wow. Which leads us to the Gospel of John. Um, and I need to confess that I love the Gospel of John. I love stepping into the scene. I love the narrative. Um, both Vicar Michael and Pastor Jules recently have invited us into the text to sit and observe. And then I stand aside with Pastor Tanner and grieve the way that many of these gorgeous words have been absolutely abused and confused, as if people were reading the text to pull out a prejudice and prove something. The Gospel of John is not easy. It's a simple read, and it's disastrous if one just stays there without going into the depths, praying, and the Holy Spirit pulling out the meaning some wonderful modern scholars have helped us out. But I've been particularly troubled by the 21st chapter because throughout my readings throughout the years, I was told and didn't question that your last uh, verses in John 20, Michael, where, um, you know, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. 
concluded the book of John. And that which followed was done a little bit later and was kind of nice, but wasn't there with a the real text. And then I picked up a commentary by Gail O'Day and thank heavens I got this assignment. I am so delighted because it's cleared up a real problem for me. Because in those last two verses, the end, the proper end of what you read, Michael, they absolutely highlight the resurrection appearances of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus. It's all about the revealing of the truth in Jesus after the resurrection, after he'd completed his hour, and what still lies before us. And so connects chapter 21 beautifully with the rest of the text. Gail O'Day writes, when Thomas sees through the physical miracle that he demands to that to which it points, the full revelation of God in Jesus. That is, it's not the physical sights and signs that are decisive for faith, but the truth they reveal. And the resurrection of Jesus and the truth goes through the disciples into the acts, into us, and it goes on. So let me, with that introduction, read what is actually part of the Gospel of John, written all together, however one wants to assign the um, writer of this particular text. I'm not going there. John 21, starting with verse um, one. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself this way. Gathered together there were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, now come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. There are six more very important verses, but I will not go there right now because this is a long text. And there's so much here. Did you notice as Jules brought up just a moment ago, 
the repetition. This is about the revealing of Jesus, not just to the people standing in front of him, but to the readers through all times. This is the revelation of Jesus, and it's glorious. Jesus shows himself again to the disciples, and before that verse completes, he shows himself again this way, that grand repetition. Jesus is revealing Jesus' self to us folks as we read along. And as you heard John 21, did you think about any other parts of the Gospel of John? This is not a cutoff. This is a glorious continuation. A miracle of abundance, fish out of a sea. Jesus did that before? Water and wine, bread to feed thousands from the loaves that were given. These miracles of abundance both begin and end the Gospel of John, the revealing of who Jesus is now that his hour has come. And the resurrection appearances, Luke has everything, well, Emmaus up to Jerusalem. John is in Jerusalem. That's where the disciples saw the wounds of Jesus and Thomas came. But then John takes the disciples to the Sea of Galilee in the Galilee. Matthew has a revelation in Galilee. John is connecting with the other gospel writers. And the gospel of John is so full of references to the Old Testament that I don't even dare start because we would never finish. But the names, Thomas connecting to chapter 20, Nathaniel, this is the one that Jesus saw under the fig tree as he was waiting. And he told Nathaniel that if you follow me, you will see greater things than these. Here comes Nathaniel seeing this glorious, abundant, miracle of abundance. And then Jesus asks about the fish. Children, caught any? No. Cast it out over on the other side. When they do so, they've got this net full of fish. It's not even broken. They bring it in. Jesus already has breakfast prepared for them. There's already fish and bread there because this is Jesus. It's already there. And then they bring what they have and they join this great abundance. That is Jesus Christ. The beloved disciple recognizes him even before Peter. And in the ending of this particular chapter before, after we do um, some of the love pieces, by the way, on the love pieces, I've heard a couple of sermons comparing agapeo to phileo, um, love and love in Greek with slightly different meanings. I'd rather not do that. These are synonyms. This is a building up. Do you love me? And when Peter says yes, Jesus talks about the putting out of the hands, going where you do not want to go, echoing words that Jesus spoke of himself and his coming crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And in those ending verses, which we did not read, Peter turns around and says to the beloved disciple, what about him? And Jesus said, no. Peter, do you love me? I'll take care of John. What John has ahead of him, that's something else. And I love this because, Vicar Michael, when you go into the pastorate, it will not be the same as it was for Pastor Jules or Pastor Tanner or me. Because as Tanner brought up, your call is your call. And God is preparing you for this very thing. You will do what the rest of us never could because God is with you as John also will go forward now, and Shauna, and Maddie, and God's call to each and every one of us, and it does not stop with the pastorate. This is the call to all who will hear. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as for the last verse of this chapter and the Gospel of John, if every one, miracles of abundance, our calls, were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written nor can I continue on, but there could be texts and dissertations and wonderful texts on just this one chapter. Thank you so much for the assignment. I always kind of discounted it because of those terrible readings that it wasn't part. It's critically part of the rest of John. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, all. Nice job. Uh, yeah. So like we said, we're welcoming the Bishop this Sunday. We're going to finish out our Planting Hope campaign. Uh, tons of great information about that. It's been shared the past few weeks and 
So come and hang out and uh, hear a little bit more about that. And also stay for a uh, coffee hour afterwards. We're going to bring that back on Sunday as well. So looking forward to having everybody around. Any other announcements? Yeah, you can come and join us live in person on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock for Bible study. We used to have Bible study on Thursdays at, I think, 10, but we're shifting over to Tuesdays uh, in person in the great room. Um, and if you can't make it, this is still, you'll still get the, the up blog of this on Facebook and YouTube. You can watch it later. And even later, still, if you're tired of screens, you can listen to this amazing dialogue about the Revised Common Lectionary on any of your favorite podcast platforms. But be sure and read your main newsletter because it is chocked full of stuff. Um, the Planting Hope Capital Campaign is for the St. Paul Area Synod, and the ask is $100 per family for three years to help with a lot of really great stuff that's going to be happening uh, throughout our synod to do new mission starts and help some folks with debt and all sorts of things. So, yeah, tune in and learn more about that. We'd really love it if you would participate in that. And if you haven't yet uh, contributed to the Building Saints Capital Campaign for our facility, you can also do that. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all the different ways that you give back. We're incredibly grateful. Oh, and swag is still on sale for another couple of weeks. So if you haven't got your sweatshirt like Pastor Tanner is wearing today, uh, that is going to be on sale for just a couple more weeks. I think the end date for that is probably May 15th. And I know a lot of people that have joined us for the first time, even if you're overseas, Marge, if you're watching this, you can still order a sweatshirt and I will mail it to you. It is not the same shirt that I have on today, which is reverend. She boss. All right. <laughs> nice. And we're, we're so glad that Pastor Tanner got sleep last night. Uh, any other announcements for us today? I don't think so. All right. Blessings, everybody. We'll see you on Sunday. Come and hang out. It'll be great to see you. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you online. Bye. Cool.